suddenly it's become a hot topic in 2023? Like, part of me is like, what took everybody so long? Hello, everyone, and welcome to another one of our ultra popular and hopefully ultra helpful Fertility 101 episodes. And yes, today we're not really talking about the usual kind of topic that we cover on this show. Today we're talking about menopause, which might have an impact on those trying to conceive, but definitely will impact, well, everyone with ovaries. And so considering our audience, we thought you might find this information useful. And if not now, then maybe down the road. So today we're going to learn about menopause. What exactly is it? Why is it important to talk about? And what are some ways to mitigate its symptoms? I'm Dan Bolger with Progeny, and this is Menopause. Today we have a really great guest, and I want you to spend way more time with her than you spend with me. But first, I just need to do the marketing stuff before we can dive in. If you enjoy this show, please leave a rating and review, or if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and like the video. Those kinds of things really help a lot. Today's expert is someone who I'm proud to say is a colleague of mine and a member of the Progeny family. She's also a doctor, a reproductive endocrinologist, in fact. So let's get to know Dr. Janet Choi, Chief Medical Officer at Progeny. I'm Dr. Janet Choi. I am a reproductive endocrinologist, trained as an obstetrician gynecologist and subspecialized. And after being in the clinical arena, helping lots of patients on their different paths to parenthood for about two and a half decades, I had the great honor of joining Progeny this spring as her full-time chief medical officer. And I am thrilled to bits today to be talking about menopause. I know, like a little oxymoronic, right? Um, but it is mind boggling to me that even though 50% of the world population is female and the people who who make it into their 40s and 50s and beyond are going to suffer menopause across the board. Um, suddenly, it's become a hot topic in 2023. Like, part of me is like, what took everybody so long? So I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty. I'm just going to give you a little sort of info session on sort of menopause 101, both from personal and professional experience. And so let's go through some of those questions. Question number one. But first, some context. As Dr. Choi has alluded to, if you do a Google News search about menopause right now, you're likely to find a lot of recent articles about the treatment of menopause and things that providers and employers can do to better offer support. So the question is, why has this become such a focus? It's kind of having its heyday, and hopefully will continue so we can broaden the scope of our care and support for all of us women are going through menopause or will go through menopause, um, partly because there are a number of reasons. One, there's more media attention. There are a lot more news headlines on menopause. I think celebrities who are going through menopause themselves are much more open now about coming out of the woodwork and not ashamed at all about talking about their individual experiences. So it's not a taboo topic. Um, and I think people are catching on through social media. Oprah talked about how she had to go through several care providers before she found the right person to help her with her menopausal symptoms, mind boggling again. And then there was a really well-written Sunday Times, uh, New York Sunday Times article this spring talking about menopause and a follow-up podcast. I highly encourage people to listen to it. Um, it was very well-written and detailed. And then the I think the other component was there was a really large Mayo Clinic study that came out this spring that got a lot of press showing that 40 percent of the workforce are comprised of women in their menopausal years 45 to 54 is sort of the peak um, era of time when when these issues crop up 40 percent that's a pretty significant chunk of your workforce that really need to be well supported if you want to retain them and we all know especially after the pandemic retention is super super important and showing meaningful support so this mayo clinic study showed that i think they calculated by guesstimation and by doing studies that um, employers were, were losing $1.9 billion, if not more, due to women who are unable to access the appropriate treatment. Sometimes they were afraid to speak up even um, to uh, appropriate treatment for their menopausal-related symptoms, and we'll go over the symptoms in a second. $1.9 billion, and it is a treatable condition. It's not like a curse. It's a normal transitional phase, something actually to be celebrated. So, you know, that's, that's I think, the reason why more and more people are now starting to talk about it, and I'm really glad as a doctor. So I think it's safe to say that it's about time that we start talking about this. Now, for the uninitiated, what is menopause? 
that's kind of a retrospective diagnosis, meaning a woman has to come in the door and say to her provider, listen, it's been 12 months or more since my last and final menstrual period, hooray, um, sort of, and there's no other medical explanation for it. And so the average age of menopause is around 51 years of age. Um, less than 1% of women will experience menopause under the age of 40. About 5% of women will experience early menopause when this happens in their early 40s before the age of 45, but again, if you make it into your 50s and beyond, everyone is going to experience menopause. And what is actually happening in the body at menopause? Females are born with a set number of eggs, one to two million preformed eggs hunkered in their little follicle cells in the ovaries. And as we age, the egg count disappears and goes down. The quantity goes down, the quality goes down. At a certain point in time, the egg count is so low or as close to zero that your ovaries just stop secreting this very important hormone called estrogen, which then leads to an absent slew of periods. Okay, so that's what menopause is. But here's where we get into the issues. What are some of the effects of menopause? Well, I can just tell you I had a hot flush this morning where I was lying in bed all cozy and then woof, I had this whole like wave of heat coming from the center of my chest and then soaked in sweat right afterwards. Can you imagine when you're in the work phase and thankfully I'm one of those fortunate individuals where again, given my specialty, I knew what was happening several years ago when I was going through perimenopause. Perimenopause are the years leading up to the actual menopause definition. So women in the perimenopausal period can, and this average age starts around age 47, will have regular or irregular periods. Period lengths become more unpredictable and start to have symptoms like hot flushes, like headaches, like vaginal dryness, like sometimes people have more mood disturbances, more depression or anxiety. All of those things kind of go part and parcel as your hormones start to change. Um, but again, the most common complaint that women in the perimenopausal transition and menopausal years um, will report back are hot flushes. Again, I am fortunate in that um, I knew about this um, given my training, and so I started myself after conferring with some other experts on hormone therapy. But a lot of individuals, even physicians, um, don't know what's going on with themselves and don't know that there's a readily accessible, safe treatment for their problem. Some women, unfortunately, will suffer hot flushes every hour. Can you imagine having to deal with that temperature regulation, dysregulation going on uh, hour after hour while you're trying to run a board meeting or finish a deadline for your boss. It's, it's, it's pretty remarkable that people are able to even function. That's one issue, the hot flushes. I mentioned there's an increased uptick, uh, uptick in mood disorders like depression and anxiety, headaches. A lot of people will start to complain of more cluster or migraine headaches occurring as they enter their perimenopausal and menopausal years. Um, vaginal dryness. Uh, I just listened to one interview where someone reported back that she felt dry everywhere head to toe. Skin changes, vagina changes, there's a urogenital, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, um, where because of the lack of estrogen, the urethra, the bladder, the vagina start to change. Um, so some people start complaining of more frequent urinary tract infections and bladder discomfort, like having to pee all the time, joint pain. Um, and other really important thing just to be aware of is as your estrogen levels drop, um, your bone health also declines too. Women start to lose bone at a much faster pace as they enter their perimenopausal and menopausal years. And this is something that's really important to pay attention to because osteoporosis is one of the most common causes of morbidity later on in life for women. So we're not just talking about some discomfort here, which is why it's such a positive development that menopause is in the spotlight right now and why it's pretty crucial that we continue focusing on menopause going forward in the future. To hammer this home, let's discuss another extremely important health risk that comes with menopause. Up until menopause, women have a better, healthier cardiovascular profile in general compared to their male counterparts. But as the estrogen levels drop, um, the cardiovascular risks, things like having a heart attack, having changes in your lipid, your cholesterol, like the bad cholesterol, LDL, starts to creep up for a lot of women. Um, so heart disease risks start to grow, go up as well. So again, it's not just hot flushes. You know, I spoke to one of my male colleagues and they're like, oh, menopause, it's just hot flushes. I was like, dude, let, let's be clear here. It's a multitude of different potential medical issues. Okay, so we spent some time discussing some of the problems that come with menopause. Now let's get into some of the solutions. 
What are some treatments for menopausal symptoms? If you don't want to resort to medical therapy straight away, and if you're like, all right, I'm having moderate, mild hot flushes, I don't, I've spoken to my doctor, she hears me, but I don't want to take medicine yet, what can I do? So things that may actually help with hot flush management, if that's really interfering with your day-to-day -day living and your sleep habits, I forgot, sleep disturbances also become much more common as women go through menopause. Um, one thing is trying to make sure you keep a cool, dark room and temperature regulate through how you dress. So it sounds like common sense, but just as a reminder, as you dress for work or as you dress to go through your day, dress in layers. So like, for instance, I came in the door this morning in the office with a cardigan, no cardigan right now. Um, and that way, if you have a hot flush and now you're like shivering and you're cold, you have another layer just to put back on. Um, there've been some limited studies looking at dietary management of hot flushes, like trying to avoid things that may, you've, may, might make you vasodilate, like alcohol, spicy foods, although the, those have not been really well proven to be that impactful, it doesn't hurt to try. Um, if you are in the obesity category, so body mass index of 30 or higher, there actually have been some studies, real good studies, showing that weight loss may actually help lower the rate of um, hot flushes. So if you're not even worried about having a heart attack, if you're like, ah, that's, that's not going to happen to me, if you're really worried about trying to manage your hot flushes, um, obesity management and control might be really helpful. When it comes to medical therapy, number one FDA-approved medication out there, hormone therapy. Um, and they're all sh uh, shapes and forms. It's not just an estrogen pill. Um, it's not just Premarin, which is an old-school um, conjugated estrogen pill that was used. Uh, we also have more... Um, bioavailable, something similar to what our body makes kind of hormones, so estradiol pills, or sticker patches that you could put on once or twice a week. Or for people who don't want that much systemic estrogen, you can talk to your doctor about using, if your main complaint is vaginal dryness, a little bit of veg, um, estrogen um, pill put into the vagina to help with the local lubrication. Those are all remedies. Now, if you have a uterus, you need to be able to balance out the estrogen impact with progesterone because you don't want to increase your risk for uterine cancer. That's controllable um, by making sure that you and your doctor discuss the scheduled cyclic or continuous use of progesterone. Now, if you don't have a uterus, this is where you can celebrate you don't need the progesterone. That's the tried and true drug. There is also um, now an FDA approved drug that came out this spring or summer called Vioza. And it's really cool. It actually blocks receptors that control temperature in your brain, in your hypothalamus. I think it's called neurokinin B. Um, and that seems to be very effective. Um, and it's a non-hormonal solution to manage um, moderate to severe hot flushes if you don't want to use estrogen or if your doctor deems estrogen potentially a little risky for you based on your medical profile. If you are having lots of mood disorders, if you're finding that your depression or anxiety is flaring up with a perimenopausal transition and you're having hot flushes, you and your doctor might decide that instead of trying hormone therapy, you might want to try an antidepressant. Paxil, and I'm blanking on the generic name, is an SSRI, so in kind of the same family as like Prozac and Zoloft. Paxil has been approved, I think FDA approval, for hot flush management as well as mood disorder management. So that's another solution. It's not just estrogen therapy in and of itself. Now, in my role here at Progeny, I am often talking about fertility treatment and fertility diagnoses. And to get a fertility diagnosis, there's a myriad of tests to go through, including lots of blood work. But if you're interested in menopause treatment, we have good news. You probably won't need to go through tests like those ones. So sometimes people are like, oh, you know, my so-and-so practitioner checked my salivary, this and that. I'm like, ah, no, go by your symptoms. There's actually a very easy to find um, questionnaire about hot flush impact on your life. And if it's moderate to severe, if it's if it's like the occasional hot flush, like once, you know, every few days or once a week, and you're like, I, I can get through my day, I can get through my sleep, it's fine, then you may not need estrogen therapy. But if you're finding that it's really impacting your day-to-day -day living and work every single day or hourly, then you may want to talk to your doctor about hormonal support. All right, so we now have some ground rules on when you might want to talk to a doctor about menopausal symptoms. But that leads directly to another question. What doctor should people see for this? Is this a primary care physician's realm, an OBGYN, some other subspecialist? I was surprised and not surprised about the statistics. Even though OBGYNs are supposed to be skilled and trained in menopausal therapy, I think 
when there was a recent survey done on obstetrician gynecologists, only one in five stated they felt comfortable enough managing their menopausal patients. And I think, unfortunately, um, a lot of this stemmed from the WHI, Women's Health Initiative study, that was released, I think, in 2002. It was a really uh, large trial looking at hormone therapy, but only one form of hormone therapy, conjugated equine, uh, equine estrogen along with a synthetic progesterone pill. and. Um, people got scared because they stopped that study early on because they were finding higher rates of certain health complications like heart attacks, strokes, and breast cancer. So a lot of women freaked out, understandably, um, because the news was very good at stirring the pot, um, and didn't realize and didn't understand, along with their physicians, that it, it, was, it was a little misinterpreted. Like a lot of these poor outcomes were occurring in women who started hormone therapy late in life, like after the age of 60. There's more and more data, especially more sub-analysis of the WHI study showing that actually, if you introduce hormone therapy when needed in the perimenopausal, menopausal years for the first 10 years, so for women in their late 40s and 50s, those health risks for the most part go away or they're much more minimal. And so the risk-benefit analysis shifts. Um, so because of that study though, the rate of hormone therapy prescription went from a high of like 23, 25% of the female population before 2002 to less than I think I saw a number that said 3%. And so people, physicians, the physicians who should be providing the care were not getting the proper training because, you know, what are you supposed to do? If someone has a hot flush, I can't really give you hormone therapy, so what else is there besides maybe an antidepressant if you need it? Um, so. OBGYN though, and ideally someone who has experience and certification in menopause um, management. And so there is a resource called the North American Me uh, Menopause Society, um, where they'll list providers who actually have a special interest and expertise in menopause management. Um, I'm excited to announce that Progeny just announced, we teamed up with two telehealth uh, menopause expert providers. So you don't have to drive 50 miles to find an expert in your area. You can just log onto your phone and computer and set up an appointment. Um, and there are some primary care providers who will take care of menopausal patients and do it very well. But the number of primary care physicians who responded they felt comfortable taking care of menopausal patients in this recent survey was actually even lower than the OBGYNs. So primary care and OBGYN physicians might not be fully prepared to offer support but there are specialists out there that you can reach out to. And I'm really happy to amplify Dr. Choi's point about Progeny's new partnerships with Midi Health and Genev, who offer evidence-based clinical programs and interdisciplinary care that can be conveniently and quickly accessed. So it's not a bad idea to talk to your HR department to see if you have any benefits for menopause. And if you don't, well, it'd be a great time for you to tell them about Progeny. And if you want help with that, we have resources for you at progeny.com slash talk to HR. And look, it's not like employers wouldn't benefit from supporting their employees. Going through menopause at work can be extremely difficult. Think about it. If you are sleep deprived because you slept three hours the night before a major meeting or presentation because you kept on getting woken up with hourly hot flushes and couldn't get back to sleep, um, or if you woke up with a, a migraine because of the low estrogen levels, um, think about how that might interfere with your work performance and your ability to advance, right? Remember, again, 45 to 54, 40% of the workforce, these are usually going to be women in the upper tiers potentially management management or executive level who are trying to advance further. Um, and if they're worried about how they're going to temperature regulate or manage their um, depression um, secretly because they don't feel comfortable enough or safe enough bringing this up in the workplace, it's going to impair their, their work ability and advancement. Providing your employees uh, with access that really kind of supports women going through the menopausal transition and afterwards from a health, mental, wellness standpoint. So I love the fact that Progeny just teamed up with two excellent tele-providers. Um, what it also means is with these tele-providers, and I've, I've tried them myself, is instead of having to leave work, take a half day or a full day off for, you know, um, medical leave, uh, you basically schedule an appointment on your phone. The provider is there at the appointed time. Um, they're not late by an hour. And then after a 15, 30 minute session, you're, you're back at work. And these are providers who know what they're talking about, who know what the current studies really support, who know what are the most appropriate treatments that can be tailored based on your needs. Next question for Dr. Choi. Can someone who is about to or actively going through menopause get pregnant? 
That is a great question. The answer is yes. Let's say you're going through the perimenopausal transition, which can last on average four years, but sometimes longer, where your periods are still coming here and there, just not clockwork like they used to when you're in your late 30s or mid 30s, like every 28 days. And now it's like 25 days here, 35 days here, 40 days, 60 days. If you're having cycles, there is a chance that you might actually ovulate, release an egg. If you want to get pregnant, great. But if you don't want to get pregnant, you want to just make sure you're using sound contraception so you don't have a conceive an unplanned pregnancy. If you do conceive naturally, sorry, unassisted in this way in your perimenopausal transition, make sure you talk to your obstetrician sooner than later. And the reason for this is, although there are women who are able to conceive healthy pregnancies and babies into their mid 40s, sometimes without any medical assistance, um, because those eggs are older in quality. Again, remember they were created before you were born. The ability of those eggs to create genetically normal, healthy pregnancies is much, much lower than when you use eggs from, say, someone who's even 40 or 35. So the miscarriage rates tend to be quite high in the first three months. Nature does its job very well. And if you don't miscarry, then it's really important for you to talk to your doctor about the appropriate genetic screening tests that are available to see, hey, is this pregnancy that I'm carrying at age 46, does it have Down syndrome? Or is there something else going on there that's chromosomally aberrant because of the age of my eggs? Should I be doing some kind of intervention there? So it's possible to get pregnant, but what about for those who are trying but not finding success? Is IVF an option? That's a great question. I think it's a conversation that each woman um, has to answer individually with her doctor based on her AMH, anti-mullerian hormone profiling, and her FSH, and her cycle regularity, and what her doctor predicts is her prognosis. Because unfortunately, in vitro fertilization, IVF, and there's a whole webinar on that, our podcast, um, is not for everybody, and it doesn't reverse the clock. Um, so for some individuals who are in their perimenopausal transition who do have occasional periods, still have a few eggs left, but not enough to make IVF worthwhile. However, if your doctor does testing and says, listen, you have a detectable AMH, I'm seeing a fair number of follicles, you're 44, let's give it a try, then it may be a conversation and a treatment process worth pursuing and having. And the benefit of IVF is if, they're, if your doctor is able to extract eggs, and with their lab team create embryos. They can screen those embryos through PGTA, pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, that spontaneous chromosomal error that increases more with aging of the eggs, to let you know before you conceive and use those embryos if there are any embryos that are actually chromosomally normal or euploid before you go through the embryo transfer process. Earlier on, we spoke a little about the health risks that can come with menopause, and it's important to take these health risks seriously. So we asked Dr. Choi if there are any additional checkups for menopausal women based on what we now know about these health risks. Really important um, to make sure that you're aligned with a good primary care provider, OBGYN or menopause expert, or a combination thereof. I mean, this is for healthy individuals. If you have underlying medical issues, it's also important to stay abreast of your specialist appointments too. Um, but in terms of health maintenance, mammogram, really important to stay on top of that, whether it's once a year, every two years, depending on your doctor's guidelines and also recommendations. Um, colonoscopy, uh, colon cancer risks go up as we get older, and you wanna just make sure that you're doing the proper screening of your, of your colon with your proper physician. Um, you also wanna make sure that you're keeping your bones supported and healthy. So strengthening exercises, muscle weight-bearing exercises. I just started doing kettlebell workouts and deadlifting because I want to make sure I maintain my muscle strength and bone health, in addition to the vitamin D and calcium supplementation that I'm taking. Um, if you're sexually active, which I highly encourage, you know, sexual activity doesn't have to stop once you hit menopause. A lot of women have reported back to me that, unfortunately, as they hit their 40s and 50s, they feel like they become more societally invisible, like people don't notice them, which is so unfair because there's so much to, to be joyful about and celebrate. So if you're sexually active, you can still get sexually transmitted infections. So you wanna make sure that you talk to your doctor about the proper um, barrier items, like condoms and things like that, to make sure you don't get the infections, making sure you're properly vaccinated. We've spoken a lot about how menopause can impact women. But one thing that's worth stating is that it's not going to be the same for everyone. I've had patients in the past where they were like, listen, I didn't have any symptoms. My periods were relatively regular. I mean, I guess they were maybe off by a little bit by a day or two here or there. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, 12 months ago, I woke up, no period, and I haven't had one since. No hot flushes, nothing. I'm like, great, cut yourself lucky. You are in menopause. Um, but 
the reality is about 70 to 80 percent of women will report at least having some hot flush and some of the other symptoms associated with hypoestrogenism. Um, um, and it's interesting also, uh, there was a survey or research study that showed that African American women, Hispanic women, were much more likely to report um, impactful hot flush problems versus Asian women. Uh, women, again, like I said before, who are obese, overweight, are more likely to suffer more frequent debilitating hot flushes. Women who smoke. By the way, another reason to stop smoking, women who smoke long term hit menopause about two years earlier in life than their non-smoking peers. So something else to not not even just the lung cancer concerns, trying to protect your bone health, your your ovarian health for as long as possible, stop smoking. Menopause is something that will impact pretty much half of all people who make it into their 50s. As we've heard, it can come with some really disruptive symptoms, and it can even lead to increased and serious health risks. Yet until very recently, menopause wasn't something that we spoke about. We asked Dr. Choi why this is something that took so long to come to the forefront. In this society, it's a very ageist society. Um, we value um, and celebrate youth, right? Um, I mean, just look at the the cosmetic and the dermatologic industry that's taking off, the Botox, the fillers, um, the fitness classes, so everyone kind of retains, especially for women, that kind of, um, you know, svelte, stylish, healthy physique. Um, so I think women are embarrassed to um, trumpet their age and what they're going through. And I also think because of the lack of experience by a lot of providers, a lot of women are afraid to even bring it up with their physicians. I was just speaking to one person where she said she went to one provider and she brought up her hot flushes, her palpitations, her headaches, and the doctor was just like, well, if you can go to work, why don't you just, sorry, but why don't you just kind of like put up with it? It's the safest way you'll, you'll get through it, you know, in a couple of years. Um, so it's kind of a suck it up mentality and I shouldn't be complaining. Um, when actually it's a real medical condition, that is normal also. Um, that is treatable and manageable and your quality of life can be uh, fantastic as long as you get the right care. So I think, you know, it's the, the stigma against aging, uh, which shouldn't be there. Um, and the stigma against um, having these symptoms, which are, you know, they don't seem like life-threatening, like having a diagnosis, for instance, of stage four breast cancer. But it is something that most women have to live with, and it should be well supported. If you're here because you're experiencing perimenopause or menopause, you need to understand that you don't need to suffer through this alone. There is an end, um, that there is treatment available, that you don't have to hide, um, that it is worth, it is a worthwhile and meaningful conversation and visit to pursue, that you shouldn't just shelve it and pack it away and say, all right, I'll just get through it, I'll have to suck it up. That there are excellent providers out there, not just physicians, but also nurse practitioners and, and professionals like that, who can help you through the process. And it's not something that you have to suffer through. You can actually get the proper treatments that can make your quality of life so much better, night and day. I've heard this over and over again from women who went from no hormone therapy, suffering through multiple hot flushes and headaches and insomnia, and feeling like they were dying, basically, to within a month or two, getting their life back on track. We need to keep talking about menopause. We need to keep working to make sure that real support is readily available to those who need it. Let's all work together to remove any remaining stigma and to just help people get the support that they need. I want to thank Dr. Janet Choi, Progeny's Chief Medical Officer, for being on the show with us today. And of course, I want to thank you for joining us too. If you want to connect with us, you can do so on Instagram at This Is Infertility Podcast. If you want to follow Progeny, you can follow at Instagram at Progeny Inc. Of course, if you're listening on a podcast app, please leave a rating and review. That's a huge deal for us. And if you're watching on YouTube, you got to smash the like button. This is Infertility is brought to you by Progeny. Please remember this podcast is not intended to substitute for the personalized expert advice of your physician. I'm Dan Bulger with Progeny, and this is Infertility.